Blessed evening to every one of us in Pagasa Center and to all of you who are joining this wonderful, beautiful evangelistic night being done by Pagasa Center. Welcome and thank God that we are gathered tonight. And this will be an interesting topic that uh, Dr. Regina Bulao will be talking about evangelistically. She will be talking about John chapter 11 regarding the call of the Lord's voice, the Lord or the Master's voice. And, and so for every one of you, I urge you and this will be very important for you to really understand. You need to focus, you need to be attentive, spend the rest of the 60 minutes maybe of try to get the message right and that it will help us in our journey of faith and so let us pray oh god our father we honor you we worship you we adore you that you are the sovereign god you are almighty and holy no one is like you while we are your creations and we fail you many times and so god we humble ourselves and ask for your mercy that you forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That tonight, Lord, in this evangelistic night, as we listen to your message, that Dr. Regina Bulaong will be preaching, O oh God, that every one of us will receive the blessing of your word. And so, God, we thank you that we have this evangelistic night to help the brethren of Pagasa Center and our 
visitors to gain something that will increase our belief. God, we thank you. We bless your holy name in Jesus Christ's name. And so let us worship the Lord. Let's join the music team. Thank you. Reckless love of Jesus today.
And oh, he chases me down, fights till I fall, leaves the 99. And I couldn't earn it, and I don't deserve it, still you gave yourself away. And don't A blessed Tuesday evening to every one of you, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. It's Tuesday evening once again, and it's time for our evangelistic night. To our friends and loved ones who may be joining us for the first time, welcome, and we are so happy that you are here with us tonight. We believe that this is not an accident, that you are joining us, and that uh, we, we pray that you will continue to be with us up until the end of this broadcast. To our brethren from Pagasa Center, London, Pagasa Center, Westcliff, Bedford, Reading, Worcester, and Pagasa Center, Ireland, and Pagasa Center, Philippines, welcome po. And to our dear senior pastors, Pastor Doc and Pastor Shay Ambat, Pastor Gosh, our youth pastor, and, and to his beloved wife, Minang Karen, to our Pagasa Center Ireland pastors, Pastor Benfor and Pastor Doris Ladurata, and to our Pagasa Center Philippines, Pastor Pastor Allen and Pastor Sai Bakani, we would like also to welcome you in our gathering tonight. Um, it is an honor and a privilege to be able to stand before you tonight and I would like to take this opportunity to thank our pastors, Pastor Doc and Pastor Shea, uh, for whose authority I stand before you. I'm also a student of the Word like you and it is only by the power of the Holy Spirit that I would be able to speak to you tonight. My name is Sister Regina Bulaong and I'm one of the primary leaders of Pagasa Center under Pastor Shea. Uh, I am the wife of Brother Anthony and I have three kids, uh, JBE and Gabby. And I would also like to say hello to my uh, lovely ladies of Pagasa Beacon of Hope. So tonight we are going to talk about the call of the Master's voice. And our scripture is going to be John 11. So I would like you to find a comfortable space, be ready with your Bibles read your notebooks and, and pen because we are declaring that whatever we are going to learn today, we need to take note of it and then go back and study it once again so that we will be able to really imbibe what God wants us to learn tonight. Amen. So before we begin, let us open up in prayer. 
Heavenly Father, we just want to glorify your name. You are amazing, our Father God. You are our Redeemer, O God, Lord, our Maker, our Sustainer, our Giver of life. And without you, Lord, we are nothing. We ask for forgiveness if there's anything in our heart which is not right, O God. We ask for your forgiveness. And today, we welcome your sweet presence in our midst. Be with us as we uh, hear about your message, O God, Lord. We pray that everyone who's listening, Father, will be able to hear, O God, the message that you have prepared for us. And that after this um, gathering, O God, we will never be the same again. We rebuke everything that might hinder us from hearing to you tonight, O God. And we lift up everything that we are going to do for the glory of your name. Thank you, Father, and we bring back all the glory to you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. So, I would like us to turn our Bible into um, John chapter 11. And I'm going to read it to you using my uh, King James Version. Okay, if you are there with, um, with me, let's all read together. In John chapter 11, here is the account of the sickness and the subsequent death of Lazarus, who we know was a friend of the Lord Jesus, along with his two sisters, Mary and Martha. This is a very, very po poignant passage of scripture. It's, it's really very touching and, and sad, detailing many of the problems that we face in life that cause us great pain. But thank God, this passage also gives us the answer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So let's begin by reading verse 1. And we're going to read right through the whole of this narrative story. Let's begin. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Therefore his sister sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou love is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death, but for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. When he heard therefore that he was sick, he abode two days still in the place where he was. Then after that said to his disciples, Let us go into Judea again. His disciples say unto him, Master, the Jews of late sought to stone thee, and go thou thither again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? If any man walk in the day, he stumble not, because he sees the light of this world. But if a man walk in the night, he stumble, because there is no light in him. These things said he, and after that he said unto them, Our friend Lazarus sleep, but I go that I may awaken him out of sleep. Then said to his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. Howbeit Jesus spoke of his death, but they thought that they had spoken of taking of rest in sleep. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead, and I am glad for your sakes that I was not there to the intent that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go unto him. Then Thomas said, which is called Didymus, unto his fellow disciples, Let us also go, that we may die with him. Then when Jesus came, he found that he had lain in the grave four days already. Now Bethany was nigh unto Jerusalem, about fifteen furlongs off. And many of the Jews came to Martha and Mary to comfort them concerning their brother. Then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary sat still in the house. Then said Martha unto Jesus, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. But I know that even now, whatsoever 
Thou wilt ask of God, God will give it to thee. Jesus said unto her, Thy brother shall rise again. Martha said unto him, I know that he shall rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believed in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And so, whosoever lived and believed in me shall never die. Believe thou this, she said unto him, Yea, Lord, I believe that thou art the Christ, the Son of God, which should come into the world. And when she had so said, she went her way and called Mary her sister secretly, saying, The Master is come, and called for thee. Now Jesus was not yet come into the town, but was in that place where Mar Martha met him. The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she rose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth unto the grave to weep thee. Then, when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. When Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him, and some of them could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself come to the grave. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take you away the stone. Martha, the sister of him that was, set, that was dead, said unto him, Lord, by this time he stinked, for he had been dead four days. Jesus said unto her, Said I not unto thee, that if thou believed, thou should see the glory of God. Then they took away the stone from the place where the dead was laid. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank thee that thou hast heard me. And I knew that thou hearest me always. But because of the people which stand by, I said it, that they may believe that thou hast sent me. And when he had, thus, had spoken, he cried with a loud voice, Lazarus, come forth. And he that was dead came forth, bound hand and foot with graves clothes, and his face was bound about with a napkin. Jesus said unto them, Loose him and let him go. Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus has done. Amen. We have just read in John 11, verse 28, When he had said so, she went her way and called Mary her sister, secretly saying, The Master is come and called for thee. Sometimes we hear folks saying, God has never spoken to me. Maybe they can hear Christian testimonies or perhaps they're in a conversation with a Christian and they hear this Christian talking about well, God said this to me, God said that, and God has guided me here, there, and everywhere. And they think to themselves, what is this guidance? Is it a red telephone straight to heaven? Maybe you have experienced this as well before. People perceived in their minds, I think at least that if God is going to speak to them, it will be in an audible voice. They will hear from heaven actual words, thundering words from God. Or perhaps they will think that some evening while they are asleep, they will see a vision and God will communicate to them very definitely through that. Perhaps they may also think or maybe even claim to have had an out-of-body experience, whether on the operating table or having taken some intoxicating substance 
or something or another, they think that they have seen themselves in another light. And God has given them this um, kind of revelation about themselves or about their future. They feel that they have to have some kind of sensual experience, whether it's through hearing or through seeing or through feeling. And unless they have that feel that God has not communicated with them. Now, while God has spoken in some of these ways in the past, there is nowhere in the Old or New Testament which indicates to us that these are the only ways how God always speaks to men. In fact, here's what the Bible teaches us regarding how God communicates to this world. The first thing we see God communicating to us is through the medium of His creation. Now, God is not in the creation but in the sense of being in the animals and in the vegetation and in the planet Earth, as some people believe. But Psalm 19 tells us very clearly that the heavens, the sky, even the solar system declares the glory of God, and the Earth shows forth His handiwork. It says in Psalms 19, Day unto day uttered speech, and night unto night showed knowledge. In other words, as we look around us, as we witness God's creation, we can see God's handiwork and intelligently without any other revelation. We can come to the rational and reasonable conclusion that there is a creative intelligence behind all that we see around us. Do you agree with that? How wonderful the creation of God is all around us. You only need to look at the night sky to see the wonder of all of God's universe. It is a language in itself that testifies to us about our Creator. God speaks in every one of His creation. He also speaks through us, number two, in His conscience. In the book of Romans, we read in chapter 1 and 2 that God has written upon the hearts of all men His law, His law being the Ten Commandments, some of which we're very familiar with not to steal not to kill not to commit adultery not to covet not to bear false witness and so on and so forth you might not realize this but you may not even have any evidence of it in your particular heart but god has written on all men's hurt hearts his law now, I'll grant it to you that men suppress that knowledge. They dilute it and they even suffocate it. And the book of Romans tells us that some have even seared their conscience to such an extent that God has given them up. Yet, nevertheless, when you and I were born into this world, God has His law written on your heart so that you ought to have known what is right or wrong. Which path you choose is your own decision, and it will finally dictate how much of that law will be left on your heart at the end of your life. But nevertheless, it is an undeniable fact that God's law is there. You see, creation, God speaks to us through it. Have you heard His voice? You also have a conscience, whatever state it may be. It matters not. You've got one and surely you know some things that are clearly right and wrong. Thirdly, God also speaks to us through circumstances. The Bible teaches of a sovereign God. It tells us that God is revealed as the one who, even when the die is cast, knows and determines the falling of that dice. That is not fatalism, but it simply shows that as Proverbs 16 verse 9 tells us, A man devises plans in his heart, but it is the Lord God of heaven who directs his steps. It's not as if God takes free will away from us, makes us robots, but we believe we are making our own choices, and we are in human sense. But there is a God of heaven who is reigning over all of these things working them together for His purpose. Let us look at this illustration. It's like a deep sea liner that 
that's crossing, say, the Atlantic Ocean, and it's going in into one particular direction. But the people on that boat are milling to and fro and doing all sorts of things. Some may be sleeping, some dancing, some may be drinking, some eating, some going north, some south, east, west. But ultimately, all of them are being taken into one direction. That is how God guides our circumstances, even if we are ignorant to it. He also speaks to us, the Bible says, through Christians. So the fourth, um, the fourth way that God can speak to us is through fellow Christians. So the first one is creation. The second one is um, in our conscience. The third is circumstance. The, the fourth is through Christians. Paul on one occasion said to the Corinthians that they were epistles Letters written on their hearts to other men. In other words, they were walking Bibles. Not everybody in this world has a Bible, let alone that they may read it. And so Christians are meant to be witnesses to others in their lives and in their character. As the little quip says, you are writing a gospel, a chapter each day, by the things that you do and the words that you say. Christians are meant to speak to others of the love of God. Do you believe that you are a walking Bible? If you agree with that, you could comment on the chat that we have. Then added to creation, conscience, circumstance, and Christians, there is that canon of scripture. Canon means simply the rule, the standard that God has given us that is found in the scripture, the Bible, Old and New Testament. It is God's word, therefore self-defined. It is the way God speaks to us. It's how he communicates to us through his word. Then sixthly, Christ himself as God's final and fullest revelation. He is the way God has chosen chiefly and uniquely to communicate to humanity. John 1.1 1, 1 says, He is the Word who was with God and who was God. That Word became flesh and dwelt among us. In John 1.18 we read, No man had seen God at any time, the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He had declared. Just a few days ago, we are reading Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 1 in one of our devotion. And in verse 2 it says, God has chosen in these last days to communicate to us through his son. Now that is the way that God has communicated to Mary of Bethany through the Lord Jesus Christ in verse 28. The master is come and called for thee. Before I expound on this verse to you, can I ask you a question? Do you not hear God? Don't ever say that God has never communicated to you, my dear brothers and sisters. He communicates every day in the wonder of creation. And what a night this evening is to prove that. The glory of the sunshine. He communicates through your conscience, through your circumstance, through Christians witnessing around you through the Word of God and chiefly has communicated to you through the Lord Jesus Christ what He wants you to do, what He wants you to be, what He wants you to have. Do you hear Him calling to you through His Word? The Bible says that God has spoken to all men through His Son. The chief message that He has given is found in Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For God commanded, demonstrates, shows his love towards us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Hallelujah. In this particular age in which we live, the chief message that God wants people to know is the call and invitation of the cross. God has communicated to men by saying, I have sent my son to die for your sin, to take your place, to be punished with my wrath instead of you so that you may have eternal life. 
That is my message to you. And I want you to respond to that message in repentance and faith to my revelation. So the message we find in scripture is, God now commanded all men to repent. The call of the gospel in the New Testament is, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you shall be saved. Have you heard this call? That is God's message for you and me this evening. His specific personal message. There's few who ever really hear it. Do you hear it now? The book of Job tells us, God speaks once, yeah, twice, yet man perceived it not. God is speaking in so many ways to men, yet so many of them possibly sit in denial and God, and say, God never came to me. God never spoke to me. God never even approached or came near me. Yet God has spoken volumes to men, but man still seems not to hear. Mary heard Christ's call to her. Let me share with you a number of ways that she heard the Master's call. She heard it first of all in a familiar voice. If we look back at John 11 verse 28, you will see. And when she had said so, she went her way and called Mary, that is Martha, her sister. Mary's sister was the first to receive this message from the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're not told specifically what the message was, but like every true Christian, Martha couldn't keep the message to herself. She had good news. She wanted to share the good news with her sister, Mary. She couldn't enjoy it uh, herself on her own, but Mary, her sister, must hear about it too. So one sister went to the other and called her to Jesus. Isn't that lovely, my dear brothers and sisters? Do you know what the added beauty to this particular verse is? There's one point in Martha's life, if you remember, when she's trying to keep Mary away from Jesus. But what a change in her life! She has allowed Christ to transform her to such an extent that she wants to bring the message of a fresh to Mary who is at that point dejected, very depressed and downcast over the death of their brother Lazarus. Let's look at that verse again, verse 28. It says that Martha came secretly with this message. I feel that there could be an indication here that sometimes when public preaching doesn't affect a sinner and bring them nearer to God and they don't want to hear the message anymore in a church vicinity or through the medium of the preached word, a, a secret, quiet, holy example of a family member can be what really makes the difference. That's what made the difference here. I don't know who you are right now. Maybe you're sick of all of this preaching stuff and gospel meetings. We pray you're not. And you really can't take it anymore. And it doesn't affect you. Well, allow the entrance of God's word into your life. I would like to encourage you perhaps to look around your family Maybe they're deceased, but maybe you can remember a father who told you as a boy or a girl stories about Jesus Christ, a godly example that you looked up to. Maybe it's your mother at whose knee you learned the Lord's Prayer or the Ten Commandments. I know that many children are turned off Christianity maybe by the bad witness of a parent or a family member or a loud-mouthed Bible-coding father who beats them into submission or a mother who is so pious that she's distant and cold and starves her children of affection and love. Those examples are travesties of true biblical Christianity. What I'm saying to you this evening is that we must never underestimate the influence of a quiet, holy, godly life that is lived before family and friends. I wonder if there's someone here this evening and a relative has spoken to you about Christ? Or maybe that relative hasn't spoken to you about Christ, but their unspoken witness has spoken volumes to your heart. 
You can't pinpoint it or put your finger on it, but they've impressed you. They've maybe really rattled you. I think the other reason why Martha came to Mary with this invitation secretly was because of the Jews who were mourning the loss of Lazarus. And these Jews were particularly opposed to the Lord Jesus Christ. Perhaps you do not have encouragement towards Christ from those around you, but the opposite, discouragement. The thing that keeps you from Christ is the fact that you know the opposition that you will receive if you take that step of faith. Well, the message is the same to you and me, and it's this. Christ will vindicate your confession of Him, just like He did with Mary and Martha. He rose their brother from the dead before everyone, and if you listen to the secret call of Christ through others, though others may not understand in their hearts what you're doing or what you're confessing, Christ will prove Himself to you if you obey Him. I would repeat that. Christ will prove himself to you if you obey him. Are you hearing God's voice in a familiar voice? A father, a mother, a son, a daughter, a husband, a wife, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle. In the church, we have seen so many testimonies of only children attending first in church and then eventually their families were all brought together to church. Or maybe it's only one parent who is initially coming to church, but eventually all the family has come and now joyfully serving the Lord all together. Hallelujah. Secondly, she heard the call of the master in a trial of life. Her brother had died. First of all, he had fallen sick and the request went forth that Jesus would come, the great physician and heal. But he didn't come. He stayed away. Then Lazarus died and we could imagine what a trial this was in the life of Mary and Martha. Let's face it, who in this building tonight, who, who amongst us was on this online meeting doesn't have any trials. The book of Job tells us, man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. But the big question is, what do you attribute your problems to? People will say, oh, bad luck if that happens to you. That's bad fortune. It's fashionable now today to use Eastern mysticism and say, it's your bad karma. You must have done something in a previous life to earn this, or you must have done something even in this life to earn what you're experiencing now. But our lives, my dear brothers and sisters, are not determined by blind faith or chance alone. The message of the Bible is that God is sovereign. God is the one who is leading our human path, guiding our way. If the goodness of God in our lives which all of us have even to a small extent have seen or admitted, if that does not lead us to repentance, often God will send trials to bring us to His side. God often is communicating to man in his problems through his pain. It was C.S. Lewis who said, Pain is God's megaphone. After all, many of the problems that we, are, that we have are because we do not have God in our lives and we won't let Him take control of our present and our future. Well, Martha came to Mary in one of the greatest, if not the greatest trials of their life and said, The Master has come and He called for thee. Martha calls the Lord Jesus Christ Master. I think this must have been a personal name that they used for Him in Bethany. But the original Greek literally means teacher. The teacher has come and called for thee. Here is a great lesson in this. This teacher from Nazareth was attempting to teach Mary something, and she needed to learn through her trial that Christ was in control, even when he seemed not to be. The thing that he was trying to teach them was that we cannot survive without him. 
my friend, my dear brothers and sisters, are you hearing all of this? Becoming a Christian will not mean that you're not going to be without problems. Far from it. They may even get more numerous and be multiplied. It will mean that, our, that in our problems, though, we will have the presence of Christ and we will be able to understand a little more of His purpose in our lives. As Jesus said that this particular trial in her life was there for the glory of God, that the Son of God may be glorified. But if we are without Christ, we will surely despair. Like Mary as she came and said, Lord, if thou hast been here, my brother had not died. The message that Christ is trying to teach Mary and Martha in our passage is that without him, we will not survive in time. And without Christ, we cannot survive in eternity. Have you learned that lesson tonight? The voice of God came in a familiar voice to Mary. It spoke in the trial of her life. And thirdly, the voice of God spoke in the torment of her doubt. She had questions and she had good reason to have them. Perhaps Mary's question would go like this. Why did the Savior delay two days before he came to help us? Maybe that question led rationally to the question, does he really care for us as we think he does? Of course, if you look at verse 3, therefore his sister sent, sent unto him saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou love is sick. Were they starting to doubt this? Let's face it. What was she to think when Lazarus is now dead? What hope is there now? He's gone. The life has gone out of his body. What hope is there now? Perhaps the circumstances that you find yourself in tonight, the only conclusion that you can come to is that God either doesn't care about you or God just isn't there at all. What brought Mary out of her temptation to doubt? Very simple. It's the personal call of the Master. The Master is come and called for thee. And we can read that in verse 29. As soon as she heard that, she arose quickly and came unto him. The reason she rises and comes so quickly is because she doesn't hear just that he has come but that he has come and called personally for her. That's what set wings to her feet, has called for me. His heart is towards me. He has had compassion on me. The Gospel writer John assures us of his love towards them in verse 5. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Praise God, the same Gospel writer assures us of God's love for us all. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is this story about Richard Baxter, the Puritan, who said concerning John 3.16 and the word whosoever. He says, I'm glad it doesn't say Richard Baxter because I know that this Richard Baxter is so great a sinner that I might think that there was another better Richard Baxter, but it just says whosoever believe in him should not perish. The master spoke to her in the torment of her doubt, and then he spoke to her fourthly in the tragedy of death. We aren't told what this message was that Martha needed to bring to her sister Mary. But I feel very strongly that in verse 25 and 26, Jesus said unto her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believed in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And whosoever lived and believed in me shall never die. Believe thou this? This is what Mary needed to hear, and Martha knew that. That's why when she heard, Mary rose so quickly 
because this was Lazarus' only hope and Mary's only hope to dispel the darkness around her. I don't know if any one of you now had a recent bereavement. Is God speaking to you through the reality of eternity, through the necessity of being prepared for heaven rather than entering into hell? Can I ask you again, do you not hear the Lord Jesus Christ giving hope in these verses, as if a voice from beyond eternity is speaking and saying, I am the resurrection and the life, and even though you die physically, you will never die spiritually because you are in me. The only hope, my dear brothers and sisters, for eternity is Jesus. The only hope for Lazarus was Jesus. And it is yours and mine's only hope. Hallelujah. On one occasion, people started to leave the Lord because His saying was so hard to fulfill. Jesus turned to Simon Peter and said, Will you also leave me and flee and go away? Peter said, Lord, to whom shall we go? For thou hast the word of eternal life. Heaven can only be had, my dear brothers and sisters, through our Lord Jesus Christ. The Master spoke to Mary in a familiar voice, in the trial of life, in the torment of her doubt, in the tragedy of death, and finally, finally through the tenderness of Jesus. Jesus saw Mary weeping, saw the Jews weeping, and when he went and saw the tomb, Jesus wept. The people said, Behold how he loved him. The tenderness of Jesus spoke, Mary, spoke to Mary because he was flesh of her flesh, bone of her bone, apart from sin. He was a man, and the reason why he partook of the same flesh and blood as we have is that he might be touched with the feeling of our infirmities and be our Savior. Do you know that? There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else could heal our soul's diseases. No, not one. No, not one. My dear friend, my dear brothers and sisters, do you hear the call of the Master through the Gospel this very evening? The message that Martha brought to her sister Mary is the message of the Church from the Bible from generation to generation. The character of Christ, the Master, He is the Lord. Through Mary and Martha and Lazarus, though Mary and Martha and Lazarus had Him as a good friend, Martha did not say to Mary, Our good friend calls thee to come. She said, The Master, he's the Son of God, and he has come. His condescension is that message that he came from the Father's right hand into this world and took upon himself flesh. He went to the cross and humbled himself and bore our sin and bled and died that one, the Master, the Son of God, the Lord of heaven and earth. He has come. He has condescended. That's how God is speaking to you. Literally, the Greek means the Master is present. He's actually here right now and calls for you. My dear brothers and sister, my dear friend, Christ is here. He's in the gospel message and he, wel he welcomes you to be blessed with eternal life. His character is in the message and his call personally to you. He calls for you. He calls for you to be saved from sin and from the power of the sin, from the consequences of sin. He calls you to service. He says, go work in my vineyard. Be my servant, do my bidding, fulfill my will. What will you say to him? How will you respond? The master is come. He's here tonight. He's calling for thee. We saw Mary responded quickly as we have read in verse 32. 
that she fell at his feet and she confessed him as Lord. Then the power of resurrection was manifest in her life. And Jesus went forth to the tomb and the stone was rolled away and he cried, Lazarus, come forth. And he came forth, he said, Loose him of the grave clothes of the old way of life. Loose him and let him go. My friend, he will do the same for you. If you fall at his feet tonight and confess him as his Lord, he will deliver you. He will take you away from sin and its darkest effects. The Master has come here tonight to this very place, to our gathering tonight. The Master has come to thee and he called for you and me. But I must warn you this. Lot's wife was also called, but she lingered. And because she lingered, she was lost. But let us look at Mary. Mary arose and Mary ran. And Mary experienced the resurrection changing power of Christ. Amen. Well, have you heard the Master's voice tonight? Again, He has come and He's calling for you. He says, Him that come unto me, I will never, never cast out. Will you come in true faith and repentance, believing this gospel, receiving it? He will give you the power to repent if you will change your mind concerning sin. Take the Savior's offer tonight that He freely gives. If you are being moved, if you want to answer the call of God, wherever you are right now, my dear brothers and sisters, repeat this prayer after me. Declare with your mouth these very words. Hallelujah. Lord, I am a sinner and I confess my sin. I thank you that Jesus died for me. I take his gift of salvation freely offered. Save me now. Make me your child, Lord of my life. I crown thee now. Father, give me grace and help. We thank you every child of God in this place tonight for the wonderful Savior that we have. Lord, we pray that we will continue to grow to love Him more. We pray that if there are any without Him, that tonight we will all hear His voice. We remind you of the words of our Savior. My sheep hears my voice and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Lord, hear our prayer and bring the sheep lost that they may be in their own way back to your fold tonight. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. My dear brothers and sisters, the Master is calling us. We know now how He's calling us in many different ways. And I pray that we were able to call, to answer His call to us. For those of you who have prayed this prayer tonight, congratulations. And I pray that you continue to connect to the people who has invited you or to our church, Pagasa Center, so that we may help everyone each one of us to grow even more in our relationship with the lord we thank you for continuously um, supporting us and being with us in our tuesday evangelistic night and even in our wednesday bible study we hope to see you again next week and even on sunday for our um, sunday cell celebration so thank you so much and we give back all the glory to god Good night, everybody, and we love you. Bye-bye.